thank you, Courtney, again, for doing this. It is my absolute pleasure. And what an incredible period we are in for you right now. So simply this, how are you doing at the moment? I'm pretty good. Pretty good. Just found out a gig got canceled about five minutes before uh, before we came on. And I'm a little like, oh, but it's going to get rebooked. It'll be fine. But we had we had two gigs this weekend. So working band now, weekend warrior band, you know, keeping busy. Oh, it's always a shame when that happens, but as long as it gets rebooked, it's there. It's yeah. always an option. Exactly. Exactly. It was a family emergency thing. It was understandable, but it was just, you know, you have your head all psyched up for something and then last minute changes. No, it's fun to be touring, right? Yeah, it's fun to be, you know, it's fun to be busy. Yeah. So out of Savannah, Georgia these days, and there's a lot of music in the Southeast. And so we're keeping busy, you know, uh, playing uh, like three sets a night, you know, kind of deal, uh, which has been good because it's been getting us geared up for the last nine months to be able to hit the road to promote this record next year. So, Well, that's been an incredible year. As we enter the latter part of 2023, are you satisfied with what you've accomplished so far this year? Yeah. Musically in particular. Yeah. Because getting signed by a label really was a nice thing to get accomplished and get that support. Uh, uh, been gigging steady, uh, you know, in this band, I play bass and sing. So three piece rock band and uh, getting our chops together. And, and now we got a booking agent to be able to, uh, to go on the road. So each of these steps was there's it's, I think it's actually tougher the music business to find people than it is to find people in the, in the, in the acting business. I mean, like you can Google and get a list of, agents it's not so easy to find booking agents in the music business i'll tell you particularly if you're if you're planning or thinking about further down the line going further afield outside of the us and to europe and stuff like that is that even entering your mind at the moment it I, I, it hasn't in that i just didn't know how to pull that off yet i just pulled off getting a booking agent for the states so i would love to be able to go overseas and gig though that would be fantastic so one step at a time right <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Watch this space. Um, yeah. One step at a time. Of course, we're on the road. Maybe you'll, really... maybe you'll hook me up now. You'll hook me up with somebody. <laughs> and we'll take it from there. <laughs> of course, we're on the road to the release of Safe Haven, your new six track EP out the 2nd of October via Fake Fang Records. So talk to me about, I guess, your vision for this release and what you wanted to showcase with it. Sure. So the number one thing is very simple. The formula is very simple. I just want people to hear my music. I've been sitting on a lot of material for a lot of years. And finally, I'm just really the last couple of years has been really pounding them out. I put out an acoustic record in uh, 22 called Acoustic Games Volume 1. And then I put out four singles with my uh, previous band, Ripple Street, that I had over the years. So and then that followed that up by starting to track this uh, this record in uh, November of last year. And now we're finally putting it out. So uh, this this one, some of the other records have been very personal, very introspective. Uh, uh, this one is storytelling and storytelling and calling, you know, BS on things that I think are shallow. Like, for example, the song Bills in Space is about the billionaire space race, which I think is the single biggest ego trip on the planet today. So I always say I would like to see those three great minds come together and solve uh, homelessness and feeding the planet instead. How about that? <laughs> uh yes <laughs> but i always say they can't monetize that so you know i guess they're not interested um but uh but yeah so so it's more of a story there's, there's a single out right now called look out and that's that's a, a classic story of a boxer who has to throw a fight and when he does it the consequences and uh, uh, you can see you can go to fakefangs.com and hear that song right now. And if you like it, you can pre-order the record. If you pre-order the record, you can get a personally signed signed CD. So we have a limited run of CDs, like 500, which I think is really cool to go old school and be able to actually have some physical copy. I love that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's so you can hear the first thing out. And uh, in October, the rest comes out. And you got to buy the whole thing. It's not you're not. We're not doing like the Spotify, the iTunes, where you can buy one song. Either you download the whole record or you buy the whole CD or you get nothing. You can listen to it three times. I think when it comes out October 2nd, you can listen to the whole record three times and then you can decide if you want to buy it or not. Which is more than enough time to get it, get get to grips with it. But it's it's a fair way of doing it because it is a six-track EP. It's very digestible. It's not um because of right. attention spans, you know, modern attention spans. It's not going <laughs> to over, overstay its welcome. Right. And I've been there and done that whole other thing, you know, and I'm just, you know, you got to get a zillion spins on eyeballs, you know, on Spotify to get two cents. So I'm over yeah. it. 
yeah yeah it's um it's an impossible it feels like an impossible world um unless you're got a market machine like nobody right. else behind you well but even the big a lot of the big artists are pulling their stuff off spotify and i really don't blame them because they're not they're not making i mean it's 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 more of an advantage for Spotify to have a big artist on than it is for big artists to be on Spotify. So I don't blame them for a lot of them pulling their stuff off of there. But yeah, the music, these... industry, the music industry is in a tough space nowadays, for sure. Yeah, particularly, obviously, now we're still kind of coming out of the COVID times, the mess that left um, for, like, local, the local scenes more than anything else. Right. But I think it's, you know, I think it's when everything went streaming, obviously, it was the beginning of the kiss of death for the music industry. And now it's become the kiss of death for the film industry. As you know, the uh, American Union Screen Actors Guild is on strike right now for the same reasons, because the residual income an actor would make when it showed on television and, and, and cable and things like that. Now on streaming, they're not paying the same kind of money. And mm -hmm. so the middle class actor in America right now, if they do not solve this problem, which I don't know how they're going to. It, brought down the music industry i think it might very well bring down the film industry yeah i mean uh I, I, I don't know how relevant it is as of this very moment but i think the last i heard that there might be a deal about to come through or something don't the writers were once again uh having conversations yeah and they're still not talking to the screen actors guild they, they didn't talk to the writers guild for three months and they talked to them once and they're supposed to be talking to them again but yet they've yet i think they, I think they figure if they can solve that problem then they can go to the actors and and solve that you know they'll say well here's the blueprint you know take this deal but um i don't know it's it, it, i mean i can't tell you as an actor how many times residual incomes you know paid my rent when i wasn't working because you know you spend most of your time as an actor hustling looking for work taking meetings auditioning and if you get three jobs a year you know you're doing you're doing well you know you can you can squeak by but sometimes those might be it might be six months from job to job. And it's that residual income, you know, check from back to the future that like saves your butt. You know, <laughs> So if you don't have that, I just don't know how middle class actors. I feel bad for the actors coming up. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's as you say, it's a mess all over the place in the film and in the music industry as well the the, the well the the even the union uh the auto workers union just went on strike in america and 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 then the un the uh the the company gm laid off a bunch of people so it's getting nasty right now it's the union right. thing fighting the the big dogs is is uh they're they're not playing nice they're not playing nice it's a really interesting time in uh in uh, certainly American history. I don't know how it's going over in the UK with this kind of stuff, but in America, it's really, there's a lot of upheaval right now. It is. Um, considering all of that then, is it easy for you to channel a variety of feelings about the state of the world into discernible music? Obviously this yes. record showcases a lot of what you feel I about think the state this, of this, this record is, is, is exactly the example of that. I mean, there are times I write stuff, like I say, very, if I'm, if I have a personal problem in life, I do help solve it by writing music because I can articulate it and, and grieve it through a, a music in a way that I can't just speak it. So that's always been a, a thing to help keep my sanity from, you know, going postal, as they say. <laughs> but I also do storytelling stuff. And uh, and this this record is that. So, yes, yes, these times are very easy. I, uh, I put out a song with my band Ripple Street on January 6th called The Great Divide. That was just about I, we were going to put it out we had the video almost done and then January 6th happened. I just took some video right off the TV and, and put it on YouTube. Cause I thought, man, we've timed it perfectly. But again, that song was just simply talking about, you know, they're saying you only have two choices, right, left, pro choice, pro life, pro gun. Yeah, but it's not true. You have, you have, it's much more, life is much more nuanced than that. And divided, they conquer united. We stand, you know, just, just, you know, stuff that's that I want to talk about, you know, does, does it make a big difference? Who knows? But if it makes a difference for one person who decides not to go postal, right, then it's worth it. Right. How, how do you narrow down such a wealth of ideas, though? So if you're using the EP as an example, it's six tracks. How did you go? OK, these were going to be the six. Well, in this case, it, it started with three songs that I'd had for a long time that were in, that were in a movie that mm -hmm. I did called Benny Bliss and the Disciples of Greatness that came out in a. 2006 i think yeah i think so uh because i but we shot it and it took a few years to get it distributed but that movie uh something i produced and started in, is in the same ilk it's it has an anti-technology message to it that my friend uh, martin geeky who is in the movie plays keyboards and he's a very accomplished musician he, he, he gigs with uh 
with uh, uh, Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. He's his keyboard player when they're on when he's when, Z, when Billy's playing on his own band. So he's a very accomplished musician. So he he took my rants, the song, one of the songs on there uh, called um, Big Brother that I wrote years ago called, you know, Who Knew Big Brother Would Turn Out to Be You, which is about how, you know, in the 1984 George Elwell concept was they were going to be staring, you know, between on our TVs, they were going to be staring at us and in this case, our computers. But in fact, it's us now with all our phones, right? It's like we've become our own big brother, uh, constantly filming ourselves at everything we do, right? So, yeah. so to me, there's a real irony to that. You know? um, so, so that song spawned the movie Benny Bliss, which the, the movie Benny Bliss starts with this guy getting electric shock treatment, and he gets a message from God that we he's he's uh he's getting to he she whatever it is is getting depressed because we're becoming too focused on our phones and not paying attention to creation itself. And mm. that movie came out. We, we did it. It was still it was just flip phones. Now <laughs> it's only ten times worse than so. I feel like I was ahead of my time in the projection of some of the things that were happening that I did not particularly like. And uh, so that spawn is, so three of the songs, uh, uh, Big Brother, The Healer, and Good Times were all in the movie. And we were supposed to do a soundtrack and that never happened. So I still wanted to get those songs out. So that was sort of the start. And then I had written three songs recently that I felt really fit fit the bill as well. And so I was like, well, these all merge together. Let's do it. So. And there it is. I'm and glad there you it is, genius. <laughs> and i'm glad you bought the movie as well because it is a very very clever and fun movie i do urge people to check it out if you haven't seen it oh right on yeah i tell people if uh you know if, uh if it's a stoner movie in my opinion you know if you, if you, if you, you know have a have a couple beers or you know like that or more because it fits that genre very well but that movie was a heck of a lot of fun to make and uh the whole thing ends up in a desert vortex and it's a concert and uh some of the you know some of the guys have gone on cory brits who played the bass in the movie mm. he's the bass player in bush now like so he was a really good bass player but I, I, you know now look at him he's like huge you know yeah um so some people have gone on to some really good things but literally it's a concert at the end and we literally shot that thing in order twice and we had never rehearsed all the songs in order ever and it was the most without a net as an actor I've ever been in my life. It was like, and then, you know, they're like, oh yeah. And all you have to introduce all these groups in between songs at the same time. Okay, here we go. Let's go. And I'm just like, oh my God, if we, if I blow this, the movie's toast, like everything builds up to this moment. But it was, it was like a real concert. It was like the, the extras, we had like a hundred plus extras. They were like, this is the most fun as extras we've ever had. Oh. <laughs> this was awesome. So that was really cool. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, go back to the EP. What were yeah. what were some of the more challenging aspects for you of creating this EP? Yeah, good question. So the challenging aspects were that so so I started, but the big conversation that kept me from recording and tracking as much as I could was was money, right? Studio time, right? So during the you know during the pandemic, like everybody else, I had time on my hands. And I started doing research. And I started realizing technology had come very far and that I could actually build a very relatively cheap home studio to at least do a majority of the tracking. And so that got the ball rolling. But at the same time, you know, no engineer, no producer. I'm, I'm learning on the fly. I'm tracking these tracks. And um, the only thing we, the only person we, we paid for a uh, studio time was the drummer. But that was also very ambitious. Like we knocked out like six songs in a day, which is just insane. Mm. Mm. So there was a few problems with that as well. So we ended up with some technical things that um, when we went to the mixing process, when I brought in uh, Guy Wallace, who also plays guitars and keyboards on the record, and he was in my band for a number of uh, months. Now we got a new guitar player. Uh, he brought a lot to the party, though. But we had to do we had to do some splicing and dicing. And um, for me, it was I was sort of applying the same principles of like editing a movie. It's like, well, and I'd be like, well, if you can edit a movie and if you can edit music in a movie, which is harder than just doing editing music, why can't I just put this part in here and that part over there? And, you know, it's obviously some of it's easier said than done. You know, just just because it's in my mind doesn't mean it's that easily executed. So there was times where there was some laborious uh, changes. The healer, I think, being the most complicated because... Uh, the way I had to record the bridge in that song, it's a different tempo. So I ended up recording those two parts separately because I, because I, you know, I had a, I had a, you know, a, a drum track to play off of, you know, I, I can't, I, a metronomes just kill me because it's not the same as 
To me, I can follow a drum easy. Goes, you know, bass, snare, bass, snare, as opposed to tick, 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 mm. dunk, tick, 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 dunk. It just, it doesn't register to me like a drum registers to me. So I would just find a drum track I liked as a, as a template, you know, then pick a tempo I like. But so there was two different tempos. So then we had to splice that all together. And the intro, we ended up adding keyboards. We ended up adding horns. So it ended up it ended up taking more work in in what I would call in the movies post, as I had anticipated. Um, and and what happens there is after after a while you start to lose perspective, right? But like like when you're in the editing room making a movie, the same thing happens. You can't see the leaves from the trees anymore after a while. And you're like. Okay, I, I don't know. I think this is good. I'm just getting it out there now and let other people hear it with fresh ears and tell me what they think. And so far, I got to say, knock on wood, the response has been pretty good. We've gotten some good reviews and uh, some people you know, I, uh, have taken the time to really listen to the record and give me really you know uh, uh, interesting feedback. And um, and they see people seem to be enjoying it. So I'm, 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 I'm thankful. But yeah, you get to that point where you're just like, okay, I just got to put it out there and it's going to do whatever it's going to do. Like I can do no more. <laughs> yeah. Know? If you keep, if you keep messing around with it, you, 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 yeah. You talk about losing perspective. You're going to yeah, I, I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah. And it, it did happen. Like I said, because there ended up being more cutting and editing than, than I anticipated. I think what I learned from this, from this process is to be a bit more prepared next time. <laughs> so that, so that things are, you know, there's you 90%, you know, got what you wanted. Um, but but like I said, I was in I was in my own studio track and my own bass lines, my own guitars, my own vocals by myself for for, you know, the good uh, majority of it. And then then when I had to deal with somebody, you know, mixing, going, well, I don't know about this. And this drum part sounds like crap. And you're like, OK, what do we got to do? You know, so it took it took more work than I anticipated, but do what I could to make it sound, you know, to make it work. Doing all that yourself, choosing to produce it yourself, record it. Obviously, you wrote all the material for the new EP. That hands-on approach, is it purely because of money is why you decided to do it that way? It was two reasons. One was absolutely financial, and the second was uh, comfort and freedom. And that comes somewhat with the financial, right? Because like, I've, I've been in, I've done studio stuff before with my other records, and you feel a lot of pressure. And, and, and also, depending on, is the, is the engineer in a good mood today? Is he not? You mm. know, like, and those things, those things affect you, you know, especially for me when I'm singing, particularly because that's probably where I'm, I feel the most insecurity or the most sensitivity. And, you know, I don't need somebody, you know, uh, as a friend of mine in Oregon calls it harshing my mellow. <laughs> so this allowed me to just go in there and track as the mood hit me and as and and with no pressure and if i didn't feel good about the vocal that day i could just come back and try it another day or i could analyze it and listen or go okay i got that now let me see if i can maybe do some harmonies against that or i just felt like i had the freedom to experiment without the pressure of like every hour is costing me money and the engineer is getting annoyed and you know i just didn't want any of that bs do you think, uh, considering what you learned this time around as well, that you would continue as you make music going forward to do this all yourself? I think what I what I'm probably going to do this next time around is we have a new we have a new guitar player who's come in who's really good and um, he's also got really good uh, tech skills. He just uh, there's a there's a big university out here in, in, in Savannah called SCAD. Savannah College of Art and Design, and he just he just got a, a master's degree in like engineering and all that music engineering and all that. He's been sending me a bunch of tracks, and the quality is just like ten times Ooh. better than what I'm doing, and just really you know polished. And so he wants to lose some work. So I think I think I'm going to collaborate with this him this, with him this time, and I think that that's going to uh, to make a big difference. In I'm going to turn to help. I'm going to turn to somebody helping me a little bit more this time, but I, I don't regret what I've done because it's been a very good learning curve. Mm. And I had to make a lot of decisions as a, as a record, as the producer of the record as well, that, that like, like, like cutting a movie that, that forced me to grow and forced me to make decisions and forced my ears to expand. So it was all good. Wasn't always fun, but that's how you grow sometimes in the struggle. Right. So I feel like I grew enough that now I'm like this next round, I grew enough to go. I want a little help. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Well said, you said an important word. They used the word fun. So I want to ask the same question. And this time it's on that. What were some of the aspects of making this EP then that was fun for you or creatively encouraging? 
Um, well, it, it was fun to get to track them out and it was fun to make decisions like, okay, I'm going to use this app with this, I'm going to order this guitar, you know, so I can get this P50s, you know, uh, pickups to, to get a 50 sound here. And then I'm going to you know, use this, this, you know, so all these choices you make to, to, to get the vibe of the record going. And, and, I, and I just started picking up bass at that point. I hadn't, um, I, I pivoted to playing bass in this new band, Courtney Gaines group, which you can actually find on Facebook and see the gigs we're doing and such. Um, because in Savannah, you can make money, you know, playing bars and restaurants, but you got to do three sets a night. So that's three 45 minute sets. That means you got to cover at least 70% uh, covers, which I'd never done before either. Mm. But I was like, I need a better guitar player than, than me to help me help. There's a three piece. You need a guitar player to carry these, these songs and stretch them out. So I'm like, I'm going to pivot to bass. And essentially I play rhythm guitar on bass. I don't, I, I'm really, I'm really an imposter bass player is how I see it. But I wrote this, a lot of the songs. So I'm like, here's how they go. And it also um, in the band, I do covers, but it's like, I'm I'm doing interpretations. I'm not trying to play like the record. That's not my style. As an I, I think what our artistry is interpret interpretation. So you know that's what we do. So we, don't, we don't play songs on the nose at all. And I, matter of fact, I often say things like you'll recognize this song eventually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but back to your question. So yeah, it, the fun part was was making choices to track, and then the fun part in, in the in the mix was making choices finding ways to save things you're like oh i don't like this guitar part that you know the guy did completely and some of it's too busy but oh but you know i like this little section here and he's looking at me like what are you talking about i'm like take this part da, 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 da. put it here put it here put it here he's like what then he did me like oh that's actually pretty good and and look out you'll you'll hear that there's this little guitar lick that goes through the whole thing that was just two licks that he did that I really liked that I was like, put it here, 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 put it here. And then, but it, it gave it something, you know, it gave it, it gave it a vibe and uh, it, it's fun. It is fun, but sometimes it's frustrating too. I mean, that's, but that's, that's any project. You're always going to run into snacks, you know? And the end result will speak for itself. I have heard the record. In fact, it's what I've been listening to all the day today in preparation oh, is to that speak right? to you. Yes, absolutely. And I absolutely what, what, love anything it. Anything in particular you liked? um well i'm a big fan and i don't listen to a lot of it so you know i do predominantly lean towards heavy metal more than anything else but so rock... good times would be your your vibe then because that was the hardest song at the end it yeah that has absolutely i like a little bit hardness but i also used to use this stuff i also like a bit of mellow i like to be able to sometimes just sit and chill out and relax and enjoy some nice mix of which has some folky tones to it just mellow rock music right, so right. it was perfect for that it's perfect oh, for me for that and that's what i think and that has a really wide appeal over here in the uk as well oh, which really? is something that's great absolutely absolutely well we love our stadium okay. rock and huge heavy black and death metal stuff um <laughs> a, you know the kind of classic country style rock music as well as great appeal oh wow cool Yes, okay. I'm expecting to do well. <laughs> oh, good, good, good. Well, it's so great to have you uh, helping to promote it then out there. I, I appreciate it. Well, no worries. And um, kind of sticking with creativity, because nobody can deny you're an incredibly creative person. Do you have any lines in the sand when it comes to that side of things? Are you happy to explore any musical avenue that takes your fancy? Yeah, so, so well, let's, let's, uh, I talk about this often. People are often asking, when did you start playing guitar? When did you start taking acting lessons? And the, and the answer is I, I started them both at 13, but my, mm. my trajectory of the approach was, was very different. I knew that I wanted to be a professional actor. So I studied acting, you know, very seriously in that regard, like in particularly method acting and, and all the, the variations of that. I studied all the, the greats as it were and studied for 20 years because that was, I knew that was how I was going to make my living. Right. As a musician, my approach was the opposite. Once I learned the basics on guitar, I didn't want to study anymore. And the reason I didn't want to study anymore was because I knew that if I knew too much, every time I tried to write, I was going to compare it to something. Oh, this hmm. is a Bassa Nova in 3-6. You know, I didn't want to like go there. So I taught myself to play at the neck. And what I what I what I so I don't consider myself much of a technician as a guitar player, as it were, but what what I play by is mood and feel. Right. So and like sometimes a song comes from a lyric idea. Sometimes it comes from just playing. All of a sudden you get this good riff like Safe Haven was it was a bass riff I came up with when I started playing bass. I was like, I like this bass riff. This is really cool. And then 
out of my subconscious comes this whole conversation about what is a safe haven, you know, uh, whether it be a house or, or, or your, or your, or your art or whatever it is, where do you go to, to, to recharge, you know? Um, so what I love musically is the moment of writing. That moment of creation is for me as good as it gets on a creative level. Uh, performing is good, but it's like a rehash, you know, the moment of writing though, is like a birth, you know, it's like this from nowhere, this thing happens. And, and when it starts coming through you, you gotta finish it. You know, you might be hungry and you're like, it's like two hours later, but you're like, no, I gotta, I gotta get this done before I lose it. Cause, cause if you, you can't just step away. At least I can't, I can't be like, oh, I've got this idea. And then I'll come back to it you know, an hour later. No, no, no. When it's happening, you got to get it down. Right then, and, and nowadays you just try to start, you know, even with the phone or whatever, track it, record this vibe right now, so you get, so you get it, and then you can build on it. But um, I love that. But I didn't want, and now that I'm doing covers, it's already starting to happen. Like I'll be like, I'll, I'll be playing some cover song, I'll be like, oh yeah, that's kind of a similar progression to this song I wrote. And I'm thinking, if I had known that, I probably would have squashed myself from writing this song, you know. So a little bit of ignorance was is, is bliss was sort of my writing approach. And I'm, and, I, and I'm honestly glad I did it that way because there's so many creative and talented people out there that if you could, you, you gotta be, you gotta be careful comparing yourself to others because mm. it'll, it'll, it'll kill you, you know? And I tell my son this all the time, like, don't, you know, about the, the you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, you know, Facebook and all that. Do not compare yourself to someone else's highlight reel. Because it's all it's all BS. It's all just gloss, right? It's all just the looking good part of people's lives. You know, nobody's life is that good. You know what I mean? We all have our struggles and our moments and our you know family tragedies or whatever they may be. You know, we're all struggling. Struggle struggle is the essence of life. But people like to act like it's the exact the opposite. I I believe in embracing that concept because I think that that's most good art is hmm. people's angst about something they don't like in society right i mean i mean if you go all the way back to commedia dell'arte acting with the masks they wore and all that that was all that's you know that was like way back in the beginning right that was them putting on masks so they could actually go out on the streets and complain about their government you know and these characters went on to then become the archetypes of of of, of literature and theater you know, but it came out of them being pissed off about something that they didn't like, right? Because there's the people on the top who are exploiting the people at the bottom, and the people on the bottom are always pissed off. <laughs> they'll keep being at the bottom, and they're like, hey, what the hell is going on here? And then it just goes around and around, right? Yeah, it is It is. It is a, a great mantra to have and a, an outlook to have, but it's so easy, easy to say than do. Telling people to get off social media and be careful of what you're looking at and don't compare yourself to this famous person or this person doing that and so on. But my God, you're bombarded with it. So it's really hard. Well, true. But if you, if you, you know, you do have a choice and your choice is, you know, if you let things, you got to be careful letting things shame you in life, right? Mm. It's like, because shame in you shuts you down. I mean, we, and we've all been, we've all been shamed and we've all shamed others. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying we're all perfect here. Believe me, believe me not. I grew up in a Chicano tough neighborhood where in, in third grade, I was the, you know, what they call it, we call it capping, playing the dozens who could put somebody down the best. By third grade, I was the best in my school. But if I hadn't been as a buck tooth, freckle faced, redheaded kid in a Chicano neighborhood, there's like two choices, fight or talk smack. And I'm an actor, so I'm, I'm I can talk smack, right? <laughs> so I've shamed plenty of people, but it was like they shamed me first. So I was like, shut your mouth, you know, be careful what you're saying. But but the bottom line is, I learned the, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of you can repress people with shame. You can you know you can you can shut people down, and but you can do it to yourself too. It's yeah. very easy if you're like said you're if you're watching people and going like oh that you know some woman's watching some other girls going oh she's so much more beautiful than I am. Yeah, but she doctored up that photo, man. Can't get a clue. You know what I mean? It's like mm. you 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 should at least be aware enough to the con that's happening to you. You know, and if you're not, then it's on you. You're getting you're getting you know you're getting shamed and you're letting them shame you. So uh, that's why you got me off on a tirade there, man. See this this is what happens. Now you know where these now you know where these ideas come from. Now I'm thinking about a song about shame. Now, see you got me. Going. Oh, wonderful. Um, well, I, I love I absolutely love hearing you talk about stuff like this, uh, particularly when it comes to the creative side of things. Because I have to ask, then, 
where do you derive more creative satisfaction from? Is it making movies or making music? Or is it a bit of both? It is a bit of both. But so, yeah, the difference is musically, you know, it's all me. Right. And and finally, you know, stepped up to the point of even having a band called my name. I avoided that for a long time. Right now it's like, no, OK, this is my project. This isn't a co-project. This is my project, my vision. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing it all. I'm finding the gigs. I'm paying the guys. I, you know, I'm taking full responsibility this time. And because there have been plenty of times in my career, whether it be mu- musically or producing movies or where I didn't. And then I regretted that. So this time I'm like, I'm taking it all on myself and it's working. It's working for me right now. You know, it, it, it's something with more responsibilities, more work, but I'm also getting a better product that I'm happy with. Um, so uh, there's something very satisfying about the music being just my own baby. But there's also something very you know exciting about when you get cast in a film. You know, I only have one job and that is to concentrate on my one role, my interpretation in this project. But, you know, you got a big budget and you've got all these people who've come together and you got all these different creative forces who have all these different ideas mm. and you, you come together and you make this thing happen. Um, and what I love about film versus, you know, theater, nothing wrong with theater, but theater is like a marathon. Start at the beginning every day and you go to the end and that's the show and you have to hit these beats and that's the show. But when you're doing film, there's really not a lot of rehearsal. You you come up with your idea, you build your world, your character, your point of view. Director has an idea, the tone they want, and the other actors have the ideas. And then and then you do it very quickly, and you make this thing happen, and it gets caught on celluloid forever. It's like this yeah. moment, this moment of unpredictable. Like I don't, I don't. When I rehearse, I, I don't like to show much about what I'm going to do in a rehearsal. I often get directors to go like, uh, "Is that how you're going to do it?" I'm like, "No." I'm like, let me do one when the camera rolls. If you don't like it, tell me what you want. But I don't want, I don't want to know exactly what I'm going to do. And I sure don't want the other actor to exactly to know what I'm going to do. Because that's where the 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 the, the game of you know of tennis is happening. They hit the ball and then I smack it back, you know? They have to, and then yeah. they have to react to the ball, and then I have to react to the ball. And if I know my character well enough, I should be able to react in that box because that character is going to have different reactions than me, right? They're seeing things from a different point of view. But if I'm locked in, you shouldn't be able to do anything to throw me off too bad, right? I should be able to react. And hopefully something happens that I don't even uh, know is going to happen. And, and and that's what I'm hoping to get to as a musician the more we play because, you know, the guys I have, they're really, really good and they and they can really interpret on the fly and improv they're fantastic and, and i'm i'm you know i'm, I'm still getting my chops you know i'm having moments mm. now we're holding down the groove and then you know you know react to that cool riff that dude just so i'm getting there and that's ultimately when you become a great musician it's the same thing. you have this ability to to answer back and forth talk back and forth and i'm hoping to get to that level and, and gigging steady is allowing me to get there now more and more because the guys like you know the guys i'm playing with they're like oh, 20 years in and they're 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 really really solid you know and it's great yeah, and, to have that level around me. Yeah, and of course, uh, repetition, the more times you do things, the more comfortably you get, the more things are tried. Of course, it's going to become much more, um, I don't know what's the word, uh, freer, if you, if that correct, works. Correct. Yeah, hopefully you're growing, right? You're continuing to progress and grow. That's that's the, that's the name of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, 2024 plans, touring plans in particular. Uh, how much can you share with me about this? What you've got in the works? Because I've had a look, not, and I understand. Not much, because there mm-hmm. isn't much. So, but I got a little bit. So, because uh, we just got the booking agent, and it's all wrapping up now to get it together to start doing stuff in January. Um, they're not going to be. It's not going to be obviously. It's going to be not. It's going to be like a huge tour where we got a label backing us for millions of dollars or something. It's what we're going to be able to do is like go to the West Coast, do like. 10 dates go to the midwest do like 10 dates go to the southeast or the east coast do like 10 dates and get back and regroup but uh there's a couple there's a couple of things that we may be able to linchpin off of and that's um one is uh children of the corn the 40th anniversary is coming up so gonna do a lot of big conventions next year it's gonna be my swan song i'm gonna be doing conventions now about i don't know 16 years I think it's time to go out on top i don't want to be 80 year old dude at conventions going what is that what's your name <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. So, so I think go out, let's go out on top on the 40th. And uh, so there'll be some good shows, but there's also uh, one, there's a third, there's a, I know a guy who has a 35 millimeter print with children of the corn, which is like, there's very few left. 
uh, and he knows some of the really good art houses in the United States that he's already in talks with that we'll be doing some, we'll be doing so going to do some sh show the movie Q and a band plays VIP thing afterward. So those, you know, they'll be able to get funded enough that could fly the band out or whatever, or, or I'll say, give us the money so we can gas up the car and do gigs along the way and back. Right. So anything that we can get like that, that, that is a solid enough payday that then we can, we can, gig around right you know that they'll mm. fund the fund the project because that's the that's the big thing with music it's trying to figure out how to even break even it's not easy it's not easy <laughs> it's not easy um but I, all i want to do is get out there and share my music it's, it's just that simple and so i'm willing to do what i got to do to do that it's just it's not you know i don't i'm not expecting to make any money on it really it's just i want to share it and open you know open people's consciousness to the possibility that hey i didn't know this actor dude does does something else, you know, and let's see if it's any good. And I'm like, yeah, that's all I'm asking. Take a listen and then make a decision for yourself. If you think it sucks, that's fine. If you like it, buy a CD. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think you, you absolutely nailed that, uh, uh, an aspect of, of course, um, showing people what else you have going on, because of course there'll be many people who know you from uh, early roles to later roles, even voice work from video games and things like that. And incredible things you've accomplished in so many different field so i have to ask considering a lot of people will know uh you from your role as malachi and chilada the corn way back in 1984 um yeah do, is it a pleasure to have left that mark or is it something that kind of annoys you a little bit these days how do you take that now well i'm at the point now where i've you know i, I i'm in acceptance mode right i've gone through all the stages already so Number one, from the gate, I just would have, I just never would have expected that movie to have such, such a big impact from the beginning. Like when it first movie first came out and people started recognizing me all over the place and kids started running to their mother crying. I was not ready for any of that. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and that's when I realized the power of cinema. You know, I really, I really did. And that really sat with me in making choices of projects I'm involved in or not. Not that I'm saying I've been involved in nothing but <laughs> great projects, but I'm aware of the impact it could have, you know? Mm. Um, so there was certainly a time in my life where my goal was to exceed that project, to have other things to talk about that were quote unquote bigger than that. But it, just, it never really happened. It's just a very strange phenomenon that the first film I ever did probably had the biggest impact in, in, in my career with, with, you know, with fans. So uh, but at least what I have been able to do is what I'm probably most proud of is that I have, I've had a 40 year career mm -hmm. that, I, that I was able to keep going. Right. Even if something hasn't exceeded that, 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 that role, something, you know, magic happened. Right. And, you know, just, it's one of those things it's, it's lightning in a bottle. You can't, you can't control those things. They happen when they happen. Um, but that 80, that eighties run I had, the one decision I made, that was a smart decision is at that because that particular movie was so impactful. I was like, I'm not going to play the same role twice. That was the goal. Like I figured I'm not going to keep playing Malachi, you know, like, cause then I'm just going to get locked into that. So I was fortunate enough to have a successful movie in like every teen genre in that eighties run, you know, can't buy me love. Like they call the chick flick or the romantic comedy. Right. Uh, yeah. hard bodies the tits and ass genre right uh, like all the genres of that of that era i was able to have a successful successful movie and even something as a small robe in a movie as big as back to the future you know uh I'm, you know, I'm proud to be part of that trilogy one of the greatest trilogies in in, in cinema history right who, who would have known right so it was an incredible run but it was enough of a body of work and enough of a different types of roles in different genres that as I became an adult, uh, I felt that people had to respect that I could do more than one thing. I felt I had a, I, I'd shown that I could do more than one thing. And that's, that's paid off for me over my career, you know, that I've been able to do, you know, continue to do a horror film if I want to, or play a bad guy if I want to, or, but then do a comedy like Sweet Home Alabama, you know, you know, keep, 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 uh, you know, and, I, and tons of guest stars that, you know, some of them were, some of them were comedy, some of them weren't, right? So it allowed me to, I, I felt I had the ability to do many things, but once you prove it, then they, then there's a little more acceptance, obviously. So that was probably the best decision I made in my young run was to just not get pigeonholed into one type of role, yeah. even though I'm, I'm a character actor, I understand I'm not, you know, playing the lead, uh, the hero, as it were, a lot of the times, um, but but that I could do a variety of roles, and that that's what I take pride in. Um, 
So I've come to accept it and am now thankful for it because I wouldn't have had the conventions, which would not, which would have, which, you know, allowed me to pay my rent when things were slow, but also allowed me to get out and meet people and find out that not only say was Children of the Corn an impact, but the Burbs. I didn't yeah. realize the Burbs was such a cult classic because it didn't do as well in the box office as they had hoped compared to when Big came out. Tom Hanks had Big come out and that was so huge. So their projection was like, ah, I did okay. But in DVD and cable and all, it really grew a life on its own that became, for some people, it's like one of their go-to films. Like when they're depressed, they'll tell me when I'm depressed or my mother is depressed, this is the movie. You're like, wow, like this movie actually helps you get through life. Like I would have never imagined that. Like that's more than I could have imagined. So uh, I'm, I'm glad that I got to go out there and find these things out, you know? It has, as you say, it's become, it's the epitome of a cult classic. It may not have done well, as you said, at the box office, but I, you know, I grew up in Ireland, uh, came to England in around 13 years old and all from my entire life, The Burbs has existed as a movie on TV, watching in different, that's two different countries. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's cool. See, that's, there you go. I wouldn't have known that. I didn't know that it played in Mm. Europe as much as it has. That's really cool to know. That's really, really cool absolutely you just, um, you just never know the splash you know it's like the ripple effect and it gets out there you just never know yeah i mean obviously nowadays with uh movies and promoting a crew overseas as well they'll often be i'll be with my wife and we'll be like okay let's put a, a movie on a horror movie on we'll choose something random for one of the streaming services and we'll put something on and you know your opening credits will pop up and your cast list will pop up and i think that it was a uh, um candy corn uh, about 2019 and it's like yeah, Courtney yeah. Gaines I was like oh wow okay this is going to be interesting then and of course you played the sheriff in that yes because because that's what happens when you get old you know you start out you start on Children of the Corn kill, killing the sheriff and then when you get old you play the sheriff who gets killed that's full circle man you know that's the that's the that's the, the story of life right there <laughs> it is it is indeed I can't wait to see what 2024 yeah, I, actually, Courtney... I actually helped I actually helped produce that movie Candy Corn that was I came on originally as an actor and then they had some funding issues and we had to go find some money, but I really believed in it and we made it and it came out pretty cool. Got to work with some really good people. And, uh, yeah, but that was one of those ones that you got yourself in and then you, you know, took two years to make instead of like two weeks, you know, but I'm glad you saw that. That's awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, right, Courtney, before we wrap up here, I just want to basically ask one final question. This is about the EP. Yeah. What for you would be a good measure of Safe Haven success when you say look back at any year's time? Um, I think a good measure would be the actions that we're taking, you know, that, that we are we able to get out there and promote it so that and 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 get it out at conventions and you know have the CDs in tow and see if we're able to get some out there. And uh and if you know few people critically like it, which I've already gotten a couple. So it's already it's already getting to, to the place I've I've hoped for and number of number of podcasts that we've been doing, getting the word out. And so and just getting the band to a level that I feel good about what, you know, that you keep continuing to grow the band. So that I feel we're going out there so that when people come to see me, because in some of these things now, as opposed to like I'm doing playing restaurants and stuff where people may not maybe know who I am. Right. Mm. Which is great on the one hand. But when the people come to see me, I know what's going on there is they're like, OK, is this going to be a train wreck? Is this going to be another actor who sucks? And that'll be funny. Or is this guy actually could play and then we're going to have a good time with that? Because I've already had those experiences and I know the actor bar is pretty low. So as long as we continue to exceed that bar and people go, holy crap, this guy actually, you know, can play. Because I, I know I can write. That's I've been playing out and playing originals for a long enough time that where I hang my hat is that I'm, I know I'm a pretty good song writer. So now it's just executing those and 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 opening people's minds. So as long as we get out there and 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 meet people and play and get some good responses, that's going to be enough for me. So I just, like I said, my goal is just to share this aspect of my of my of my creativity, and I'm in a position and stage in my life where I can, I can do it. So I'm I'm going out to have a good time. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. That's wonderful to hear. That's simply what we want. And of course, the six track EP. That is Safe Haven is out on October 2nd via Fake Fan Records. Make sure you pick it up. And also, if you get the opportunity, if you're in your area, go see you guys play live. Hey, who knows? In 2024, things work out wonderfully for you. We might get you over here. We have a wonderful art house cinema in the center of Leicester Square of London that would work wonderfully for Q&A. 
the live show, the movie, all of that. So, um, all right. Well, yeah. I guess you're gonna have to you're gonna have to produce an event now. Then I'm putting it over there on you. Make it happen, man. We'll show up. <laughs> but yeah, just oh, to be clear, goodness. just to be clear, fit. You have to go to fakefangs.com to get this record. It's the only yes. way to get it. We're not going through Spotify or iTunes or any of that. So fakefangs.com. And again, it comes out October 2nd. And uh, you can follow the band on Courtney Gaines Group on Facebook. So if you want to feel what we're doing touring-wise, that's how you're going to find out. There it is. Courtney, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Pleasure. Pleasure. Nice meeting you. Thank you very much for watching. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider hitting the subscribe button button. It is gratefully appreciated. You can find us over at gbhbl.com, our full website where reviews, news and so much more goes up daily. We're also on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, threads at GBHBL. Just search for GBHBL and you will find us out there. We also have merchandise on sale. You can access the shop via the website.